Hi, you're 11. In this video, we're once again going to be looking at the key ecosystems case study of the deciduous woodland. In particular, we're going to focus on threats which deciduous woodlands have faced over time. And we're then going to move on to management and look at the new forest as a case study of how deciduous woodlands can be managed in a sustainable way. If we begin by looking at threats, now these often apply to the new forest, but to be honest, they apply to any woodland here in the UK or any deciduous woodland. When we talk about threats, generally we look at three different problems. First being timber extraction, then agricultural change, and then finally we look at urbanization and population growth. If we start by focusing on timber extraction, timber extraction just simply means that trees are being cut down and then the wood is being used for a variety of different purposes. Now, woodlands in the UK have been cleared for hundreds of years. Timber has been used for a wide variety of different uses. So for example, house building as a fuel source, it was used to build large cathedrals, um, it was used to build large ships within the Navy. In the First World War, a lot of timber was needed to build trenches. Um, so for hundreds of years, deciduous woodlands have been cut down, and then the timber has been used for a variety of different purposes. Recently, since around 1919, the Forestry Commission, they've planted millions of trees to try and replace those trees which have been lost. The problem, a lot of the trees which were cut down were native species, deciduous woodland. They've been replaced with coniferous trees. Now, coniferous trees are faster growing, so hence the attraction of planting those. You can plant them and then you can extract the wood more quickly. However, a lot of the plantations of coniferous trees, they were monocultures. Only one species was grown rather than a mix. It meant that the canopy of the woodland, it was evergreen all year round. So very little light made it down to the forest floor. So there was very little biodiversity in those woodlands. Now, recently, there has been a move towards wood burning stoves. So, for example, a lot of people in the last 10 years or so have been putting those into their homes. Because of that, wood has become an attractive fuel once again. And therefore, trees are needing to be cut down to supply those wood burning stoves. A second threat which faced deciduous woodlands is agricultural change. Now, agricultural change is just a term which we use for farming. Now, in around the 18th century, we had an agricultural revolution. We were able to produce more food and we needed to because of a growing population. And it meant that many woodlands were cut down and the land was cleared. And instead, it was used to grow crops for our growing population. More recently, we now cut down fewer trees than before. So, for example, in the last 100 years, only about 7% of our ancient woodland was cut down for agricultural use. But even so, farming has lots of negative consequences for deciduous woodlands. Woodlands tend to be surrounded by lots of farmland. Those farmlands are sprayed with chemicals like pesticides and herbicides, and the woodland species are often damaged by these. Our final threat to deciduous woodlands, they are social causes of deforestation, and that is urbanization and population growth. Now we saw in the change in cities topic, urbanization is the increase in the proportion of people who live in towns and cities. And then population growth obviously means that we've got more people living in the UK than ever before. Now there's been a trend in the last hundred years or so, more and more people have been moving to urban areas. And you can see that within the graph. So there you've got our urban populations. Um, and the graph itself shows the UK's population growth, how it's increased from 1960 to 2013. Now, as the UK's population gr has grown, it's meant more and more woodland has needed to be cut down for a variety of different purposes. So, for example, to build our urban areas, we need lots of space. In order to obtain that space, woodlands have been cut down. We also need more transport routes, so road construction has been a key cause of deforestation uh, as well. Now, if we move on, you've got one example of a deciduous woodland, which you need to know about in detail, and it's the new forest. Now, the new forest is an example of a woodland which has um, been victim of some of those threats, but it's also been managed in a sustainable way. Now, if this comes up, it's likely to come up as an assess or an evaluate question. So potentially the eight marker. So it's important we know about it in detail. 
Now you can see the map of the UK, the small one there in the top right corner, it shows the location of the New Forest. So you can see it there in southern England. It's within the county of Hampshire. It's a national park, so it's an area of outstanding national beauty. It's protected because of the quality of its national environment. But the aim of a national park is also to encourage tourists to visit. Now, tourism is important to this region. So every year, 15 million people visit the New Forest. That brings in around £500 million to the region. But the people who visit, they also cause problems for its management. Now, if we look at the threats which face the New Forest, that picture summarises the first one. So the visitors who visit, they can do lots of damage. They can trample on plants. They can cause erosion by walking. They often park their cars on verges. Sometimes they'll start fires with their barbecues. They can scare the local wildlife. And of course, they can drop litter. This picture, it represents uh, verderers. Now, verderers are people who use the new forest. They've got rights to pasture ponies, pigs, and other livestock. The livestock themselves, they often roam freely. However, they can be run over by visitors in the new forest who are driving too fast. The ponies themselves can also be dangerous to visitors, particularly if they've got new foals. Timber is extracted from the new forest. Um, some of those timber operations, they can be dangerous. Um, and then we've got to control where visitors can go. And then half the woodland in the new forest is privately owned. Unfortunately, about 40% of that isn't managed. When it's not managed, you can see in that picture, it becomes very overgrown. You get rotten timber on the forest floor and it's not attractive to visitors. Now, my advice, you might just want to, to pause here. Having a look at those pictures, could you note down some threats which the new forest currently faces? Okay. Moving on. The final thing you need to cover with the new forest is how it's been managed in a sustainable way. Remember, if something's been managed in a sustainable way, it means it meets the needs of the present generation and it won't compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, the first example of management in the new forest is woodland management. Now, this involves lots of different aspects. So, for example, when foresters are cutting down timber, um, they try to do it in the winter time. So they'll cut down timber, they'll plant new trees. They try to do that in the winter time because that's when there's the fewest visitors. It's going to reduce the risk of injuries due to forestry activities. Where pesticides are needed in the forest, it's hoped that they're used sparingly and that's going to avoid damaging the local ecosystem. Now, trees are still cut down for timber, but when they are, they're always replaced by deciduous trees like oak. It means it's trying to return the woodland to its natural environment, trying to replant those native species. Our second example of sustainable management involves wildlife, and it's represented by some of the, the creatures in those pictures there. Now, any work which takes place in deciduous woodlands Generally, it takes place in the winter months, so we try to avoid things like April to August so that things like nesting birds aren't disturbed. In terms of birds, there are lots of bird species which exist in the new forest. So good examples will be birds of prey like sparrowhawks, buzzards, kestrels. Now, they're all protected by law. Before any cutting down or felling of trees is carried out, trees are checked for nests. Um, if they're nests are found then felling is going to be delayed until the young have left the nest so those trees aren't going to be cut down you can see the picture there sand lizards sand lizards are rare they're endangered they were extinct in the new forest by 1970 however in 1989 a reintroduction program began by 1998 806 young sand lizards were released onto six selected sites and there have been signs of breeding by adults in the area. The programme is a success. Now, deer are uh, existing within the park. There's lots of different species of deer, so fallow, roe deer, red deer, sitka deer, and muntjac. Now, in the past, those deer numbers would have been controlled by things like um, 
wolves or lynx. Today, there aren't many natural predators for the deer in the woodland. Now, deer can cause problems for forest crops. They can trample on them. So today, culling of deer takes place. Um, generally, again, that will take place in the winter so it doesn't interfere with tourists and visitors. Your penultimate example of management is things to do with leisure and recreation. So there's lots of different systems which are used to control where visitors go. In the New Forest, there's lots of different car parks, the idea being that people will use those car parks and therefore they don't park on roadside verges. And then cycle routes and cycle paths have been set up through the park and they're going to guide visitors away from vulnerable areas. And then they'll try and also encourage people to use their car less. Finally, you can see there with the picture, we've got um, the New Forest Tour. That's an open top bus but there's also electric vehicle and bike hire. Again, it has the same aim of trying to reduce the number of vehicles which are driving through the new forest. To support with that, there's lots of electric vehicle charge points which are provided through the National Park. The last set of pictures, they represent education. So the picture which you can see there, the New Forest Centre and Museum, that was opened in 1988. It's got lots of different displays and activities. Visitors can go there. They can learn about the history of the forest and also sustainable management techniques, which try and preserve it for future generations. There is a visitor leaflet, which is called Five Ways to Love the Forest. It gives visitors advice about driving slowly through the forest and why they should do that. It encourages people to leave the car behind and it talks about green leaf businesses. Now, they're local businesses which have signed up to use local products where possible. They're businesses which try and encourage walking and cycling, and they also set aside 10% of their grounds for local wildlife. Now, half of the forestry in the new forest, it's managed by the Forestry Commission. Now, the Forestry Commission, they run courses in sustainable woodland management, Woodland owners can attend those courses and they'll be supported with conservation work. Now, whenever you look at a case study of management, one thing you must have is an opinion. You need to decide overall how successfully do you think the new forest is being managed. Now, that's going to be your personal opinion. You can argue it either way. My advice, I would have some ideas ready. Which examples of management do you think are going to be particularly effective? Which ones do you think are going to be less effective? Generally, if you're looking for one to be effective, um, a number might help. OK, so that will prove to show that it's working if you can back it up with a fact. Less effective, you need to be able to explain why you think it's not going to have a big impact. So if I gave an example and said the leaflet of five ways to love the forest, yes, that's going to give great advice to visitors. However, it's unlikely that every single visitor will read it. And those who do may choose not to follow the advice. Okay, so make sure you have an opinion on how well the forest is being managed.